I'm Robin Landa. I tell brand stories, design, teach, and I'm the author of 20 published books, including Build Your Own Brand. I've won lots of awards, including the National Society of Arts and Letters, the National League of Pen Women, Creativity, the Art Directors Club of New Jersey, and more. And I was a finalist in the Wall Street Journal's Creative Leaders Competition. As a distinguished professor in the Robert Bush School of Design at Kane University, I have the opportunity to mentor very talented people, a few of whom are featured in my book, Build Your Own Brand. I have developed brand stories, designed and written copy for Lava Dome Creative, among other design studios and agencies. Now, as the creative director of my own firm, RobinLanda.com, I work closely with marketing executives and their companies and organizations to develop brand strategy and stories, as well as enhance corporate creativity. Today I'm presenting a 10-step guide to personal branding. The hashtag is there, as Kathy mentioned. It's hashtag capital D design, capital B-Y-O-B. You can follow us on Twitter. Developing one's own brand identity seems to be one of the toughest assignments for any creative professional for many reasons. One of the reasons is that many of us have misconceptions about how to best present ourselves in the professional arena. And here's another. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Let's set some goals for creating a personal brand. Identifiable. It's yours. It's not generic. It cannot be easily used for anyone else. That is critical. Memorable. It's cohesive. It's unified across media. It should make an emotional connection with people so that it will resonate. It's distinctive. It should differentiate you from your competition, from the people with the same skills doing the same work. And finally, it's flexible. It can be tailored or even sub-conceived for each media channel. And I'll explain more about media channels later and how to use them. So what do you base your identity on? Very basically, your training. That means your skills and your education, perhaps your career experience. What makes you you? Your personality, your epitomizing traits, how you think. Your brand promise, a functional benefit that you can deliver. And I'll talk more about that later as well. Your artistic vision, your sensibility, your unique point of view. Step one in this guide is to codify your vision. You have to define your brand essence through design and words. Drew Davies advises, never forget that building your own brand is about determining the things that make you different from every other designer and shining a white hot spotlight on them. You don't have to do research on this subject because you're the subject. However, and here's the big challenge. You do have to distill meaning from everything you know about yourself and all your experiences. Even if you think you know exactly what you want to highlight about yourself, it's worth a bit of examination. At times, one's first thoughts might be too generic. So what is your unique vision? What is your aesthetic? Do you have a point of view? How can you communicate it to others? How can you make a positive emotional connection? Are you good at finding insights? Are you a type maven? Do you hold to an aesthetic philosophy? Are you attracted to certain forms and shapes and color palettes? In other words, what is your design sensibility? I like to borrow the term sense and sensibility. Design sense to me, is a skill set. It's pretty much what most of us learned in college, if we were paying attention. The same standard design skills most of us possess. Whereas, your sensibility is what distinguishes your work, how you visualize, how you use color, how you use type, what makes your work yours, your insights, and so on. 
If you watch any of the reality tel talent programs on television, you'll hear more than one judge say that the contestants need to distinguish themselves. Last year on America's Got Talent, Howard Stern advised a singer about her performance and styling. I think you need to do something to distinguish yourself. You have to be a recognizable type of something. And that's how the, one of the dictionaries defines brand. Beyond being a recognizable type of something, you have to make an emotional connection with the audience. That's ideal. And again, going back to the reality shows, just the other night on The Voice, Usher said that his mentor established an emotional connection with the audience. And that's what helped her get to the top what Mark Gobey calls emotional branding. So how do you find that insight about yourself? You have to be a recognizable type of something, so how do you do it? I'm going to present a couple of exercises and explain things about archetypes, complements, associations, ethical virtues, and then give you some prompts that you can use. One exercise is from Steve Liska, and he says, pick a CD cover that is your personification. Figure out why. Another way to find an insight is to utilize an archetype. An archetype epitomizes a trait. It's a model for things of the same type. Does Apple, the Apple brand, project the image of the archetypal outlaw? Does the Nike brand project the archetype of a hero? Which archetype should your image project? Creator, characterized by being innovative, imaginative, and artistic, a nonconformist who appreciates aesthetics. Explorer, characterized by adventurousness, by being inquisitive and freewheeled. Willed, pardon me, freewheeling, I would imagine, too. Hero characterized by a symbolic expression of courage, triumph over adversity, one against the universe, a defining struggle about existence. A hero allows us to better understand our plight. For more on archetypes, I recommend reading the seminal work by Joseph Campbell, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, of course works by Carl Jung, and a book about, specifically about branding by Margaret Mark and Carol Pearson, The Hero and the Outlaw. Pardon me. Another way to find an insight into your sensibility is through compliments. Imagine you are two people, two opposites perhaps, or a, a duo, perhaps a famous duo. Can you, can that help you identify your strengths if you think about an existing pair of people who complement one another. This was a really fun exercise for me to think about very famous pairs and perhaps you can identify with one of these on the list. Could a pairing help you identify your strengths? Industrial and handmade, nimble and strong, real and ideal, consonant and dissonant, geometric and organic, human and beast. By the way, nimble is one characteristic that many, many employers are looking for right now in our ever-changing technological world. Could a positive association help differentiate you? An association denoting one kind of object or idea used in place of you to suggest a likeness or an analogy. Could a semiotic vehicle help differentiate you? Dr. Stephen Doloff, professor of humanities and media studies at Pratt advises, a brand is either a semiotic vehicle or a destination. If it's a vehicle, it's designed to visually and or verbally direct your audience to some generally positive idea, feeling, or attitude with which you want to be associated. For example, sunshine bakers. If it's a destination, it's designed to make your audience formulate for themselves your virtues by experiencing your product or service. Think Smucker's Jam. So in choosing a personal brand, ask yourself this question. Do you initially want to project a positive association 
or do you want to create a mystery? But always remember that any semiotic vehicle, for example, a symbol, has denotative and connotative meanings. You can't avoid the connotations in a culture. Can an ethical virtue help define you? Are you even-handed, tolerant, rational, flexible, humble, courageous, or that ever-wanted nimble? Here's a tool that I really love, and you probably use it without realizing it, but I'm going to give you some rules to make it even better. And if you've ever uh, found that talking something through helps, this is for you. Find a listener. This person should not attempt to help you solve the problem or even make any comments. If no one is available, use a tape recorder. You will need to actively listen to what you say for a possible key insight. So active listening here. Present an overview of the problem, then explain it in more detail. The listener should focus on you, not to encourage you to keep speaking, but not comment so as not to interrupt your stream of thoughts. If this process has not yet stimulated an insight from which you can develop an idea, then go to the next step. Once you finish speaking, the listener is then free to ask questions, questions to clarify points or questions that pop into that person's head based on what you have presented. If the person has been attentive, then he or she may have some pointed questions that can aid in focusing your thinking or ask the person to take notes, which you could use as jump starts later on. Here are some prompts. These prompts are taken right out of Build Your Own Brand, the, the guided sketchbook. I use this one in class all the time, and, and students seem to find it very helpful. Choose four nouns to represent you, such as a tree, bear, or a trumpet. Sketch and design, or place them in hierarchical order. Often it's the hierarchy that really helps in this project. Here's another terrific prompt. You don't have to use the ones on my list, but if you would make a list of all the skills you possess and then all the skills you aspire to possess, that can be very helpful in figuring out your own brand. And some of these may sound like they overlap, but often we have to flesh it out in different ways. State two facts about your area of expertise. Interpret one fact in a new way. Sometimes how you say it or how you spin it, if you will, will help reveal an insight. Step two, determine your brand promise. How would you add value to a studio or agency? What can you offer? What specifically do you bring to the table? According to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times in his article, How to Get a Job, which was in, in the newspaper recently, very recently, employers increasingly don't care how you acquired your skills. They just want to know one thing. Can you add value? You will create a great personal brand if you focus on your brand promise. If you make it very clear what people should expect from you and how you add value. Larry Vincent of the Brand Studio suggests, your brand promise is the benefit you commit yourself to deliver. The alternate path is to position yourself without a promise. In that case, you can make a lot of claims and consistently alter the way you are positioned to satisfy trends and the whims of opportunity. However, can you con continuously reinvent yourself to do what the job market demands? The value you add is a functional or emotional benefit that is authentic to you. Sorry. You want to evaluate your promise. Ask people if they think your brand promise is authentic. Does your brand promise generate enthusiasm? 
Does it help differentiate you from the competition? Is it based on an insight? Does it help tell a story about you? Will people connect with it? To do this, you have to define your strategy. Synthesize the following into a core concept. Your story. What is unique about you? Your brand promise. Your deliverable value. The value that you can add to any agency or studio. And your position. How do you position yourself against the competition? These are the factors to keep in mind. In fact, it's really good to put these on an index card and keep them near you or in a on a note on your computer. Differentiation, unique verbal and visual identity. And that's what we're talking about today. Authenticity, it has to be identifiable and it has to be based on a genuine attribute. Consistency, integrated communication across media channels. Relevance, it's based on an insight into the audience. You must know your audience, you must know what they're about, and what they're looking for. To do this, it's good to tap into your own authenticity. What is it about your artistry that makes you you? What do you do best? Do you have a combination of skills? Is there a specific passion or interest that you have? Typography, for example. Do you have a unique background? Do you have an adjunct skill set? For example, do you come from the marketing side or do you, are you a musician and could, that could help you with animation? Any, anything that would give you an edge. Transmedia storytelling. Henry Jenkins, who conceived the idea of transmedia storytelling, said, in transmedia, elements of a story are dispersed systematically across multiple media platforms each making their unique contribution to the whole. Each medium does what it does best. For example, comics might provide backstory, games might allow you to explore the world, and the television series offers unfolding episodes. Of course, he's told, talking about big brands, but we all need to think in a transmedia format. If you tell your story exactly the same way in each channel, then your story is singular rather than dimensional. Formulate and create a strategic and unified program. Each media channel contributes to the story. Weave common threads across media channels so that we don't have to reintroduce ourselves each time the brand presents itself. And ultimately, each experience with your brand presence builds your brand story. Step four, your verbal identity. What is your story? You have to draw upon raw material, the many facts and parts of you, your life, your job, your experiences, your knowledge. You have to craft a central message. The form of your identity will follow the nonfiction. As you all know, form follows function. And Brian Collins, the great branding expert, says form follows story, or form follows fiction. <coughs> Pardon me. In our case, form has to follow nonfiction. And of course, as in any branding project, there's always a creative brief. But this one's about you. And here are your key questions. And this, again, should always be kept in mind. What is your goal? Who is the core audience? What would you like the core audience to think about you? What is the key emotion for building a relationship with the audience? What specific idea, content, visuals, and design will assist in this? What is at the core of your brand personality? Which media will best facilitate your goal? What's your budget? And what is the single most important takeaway every time I experience your brand? How can I communicate who I am? What are two or three distinctive traits or ways of thinking or creating that make me the designer I am? How do I present myself professionally? How do I want people to perceive me? And this is key. 
you must try, and it's very difficult, you must try to see it from the audience's vantage point. It's not just your vantage point, it's theirs that counts. What is my unique selling proposition? Sean Adams advises, identify the qualities that are unique and personal to your identity. Promote them relentlessly. Kristen Compilatero advises, and I'm going to read a, a longer quote to you than what is on your screen. Just like brands must compete with others in their categories to break through the cluttered consumer marketplace, professionals must break through the competition and general industry noise to land great jobs. The key to standing out is knowing what you have to offer that is special and unique and making sure every touch point of your brand conveys this unique selling proposition or USP. Once you figure out your USP, boil it down to one statement so short and sweet it could fit on a badge pinned to your lapel. This is your professional branding positioning and your guide to creating the plethora of touch points that will bring to life who you are and help you stand out versus the competition. From your elevator pitch to your professional website, every vehicle should bring your brand positioning to life. With a clear, single-minded positioning, you'll differentiate from your peers and have a memorable impact on professionals in your industry. So the first point in any verbal identity is the brand name. What's your name? You must be consistent across media or people won't find you and be able to identify you. Some people make a case for being conservative. You can make a case for being less conservative. So should it be Jim or James or even Jimmy the Kid? One of my former students who's now a successful designer wanted to go by the name Jimmy the Kid. And he was a non-traditional age student and his wife said, Jimmy the Kid sounds ridiculous. But I encouraged him to use Jimmy the Kid because his work had great wit and he was funny and I just thought it, it made sense and it totally distinguished him. So be consistent across media. What's your core message? Synthesize experiences and expertise into a concept or premise. Look for an insight. Omit. What you edit out is as important as what you leave in. This may be perhaps one of the biggest issues for most people. I'll say it again. What you edit out is as important as what you leave in. Show, don't tell. You've heard this before in, in writing classes. Use action to show. Don't say you're funny. If you're funny, be funny. State it clearly and memorably. Specificity helps. Using superlatives and making general statements isn't that useful, and superlatives are really rather empty. Consider the payoff. What is the benefit to the employer or client in how you define yourself? Always think about how it relates back to the audience. This is a great exercise, and you might think it, it's it. It's not at first glance, but it truly is. Write the most obvious, generic, or boring statement about yourself that you possibly can. Critique it. What makes it obvious, generic, boring? What would make it interesting or compelling? The reason that this is a great exercise is that most people write a very generic statement about themselves, and you should not. Step five, the elevator pitch. I highly recommend Stephen King's book. Its title is called On Writing. In there, he advises, take any noun, put it with any verb, and you have a sentence. It never fails. Write short, complete sentences containing a subject and a predicate, a verb. Use action verbs. Use the active voice, not the passive voice. In the passive voice, we don't know who's speaking. Passive, for example, the concept was generated, active. I generated the concept. Much better, we know who generated the concept. 
Use adjectives and adverbs sparingly. Avoid superlatives. Rather than saying you're the best, give an example of what makes you the best. Avoid redundancy. Edit your pitch. Edit, edit, edit. Use everyday language. Avoid cliches. Now you're in the elevator. You're riding the elevator with somebody for 30 seconds. You have only 30 seconds to talk to this person and make an impression. You have about three or four sentences. The first sentence should draw the listener in or the reader in, depending on where you're using this. The last sentence should leave an impression. Draw interest. Hook the listener with an attention-grabbing active first sentence. The opening line leads to more, pointing to a fuller story. The second sentence has content, a little more content. Engage the listener with content about yourself. Use energetic and specific language. And the third and fourth sentences are the payoff. What can you bring to the party? The last sentence should leave an ending like a performance. Ta-da! That's what you're going to imprint on the listener. Twitter. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the creative brief, you want to determine which platforms, which channels are best for you. Maybe Twitter is better for you, maybe Facebook, maybe Tumblr, that's up to you. But on all of them, here is your mission to do one of the following. Inform, entertain, promote, connect, do good. My advice here was just featured on artworksarts.gov. Be positive, not negative, and for heaven's sake, be discreet. Don't compromise your present or your future. I'll quote from Winnie the Pooh, think, think, think. There is something about Twitter and Facebook, the anonymity of the web, that makes us want to post things that we really should not post. For your Twitter bio, conceive one statement about yourself to hook the reader's interest. Make them curious to know more about you. To start trying to write a bio, you could start with odd combinations or juxtapositions, two strengths juxtaposed or combined. Then try writing a very straightforward bio statement. Then see if there's a way to combine them, to mesh them. The main thing to think about is what is the takeaway you want people to have after meeting you. And here are some prompts. This one is really a treasure from Sean Adams. List 10 values you believe are critical to great design. Now delete seven of these. Drop any ideas every other designer would state, responsible, high quality, etc. Take the final three that are most personal. This is your brand. And again, this goes back to that exercise about writing a generic statement. You don't want it to be generic. You want it to be most personal. Your one-man band. Illustrator, write what you do differently. In two sentences or less, explain what makes you different than your competition. Step seven, visual identity, your logo. For this, we're going to return to the design brief. I called it a creative brief before because we were dealing with the verbal identity. Now we're designing the visual identity. And again, all of these must be considered. You're building a relationship with an audience. You're creating your brand personality, you must know about the core of it, you must build a key emotion, all of this counts. Jamie Lynn Pescia says, if you design a logo for yourself, it better be the best logo you have ever created. If you are questioning if it is, then it's not. Trash it. A logo tells a visual story. Your logo tells your story. Guy Boucher, a creative director at 72 and Sunny says, a logo is the smallest canvas for storytelling. A logo is a unique identifying symbol. A logo compresses meaning into one small compositional unit. 
there are different kinds of logos. A logo type, or logo that we use generically, comes from the word logotype, and it specifically means your name spelled out in unique typography or lettering. A letter mark is the logo is created using your initials or other representative letters. And then there's a symbol, and there are five different kinds of symbols that you can use. A symbol generally is a pictorial, abstract, or non-representational visual or letter forms, which may or may not be coupled with your name or studio's name. A pictorial symbol is a representational image resembling or referring to an identifiable person, place, activity, or object. An abstract symbol is a simple or complex rearrangement, alteration, or distortion of the representation of natural appearance used for stylistic distinction and or communication purposes. A non-objective or non-representational symbol is purely invented. It does not relate to any object in nature. It does not literally represent a person, place, or thing. A letter form symbol or letter forms used as the symbol, often coupled with one's name. And a character icon is an avatar the embodiment of one's personality. A combination mark is a combination of name or words and a symbol. And an emblem, and in a combination mark, you can separate the name from the symbol. In an emblem, you can't. An emblem is a combination of name and images that are integrated, never separated. What kind of relationship should the type and image in your logo have? I, I believe this with all my heart. One must take a supporting role. Either the type or the image has the major role. The other component takes a supporting role and is more neutral. If they're both major, they're going to compete with one another for attention. What kind of characteristics do the type and image relationship have? Do they share characteristics? Do they have similar defining characteristics? Is there agreement in their form that can produce consonants? Or is there contrast? The type and image possess differences, contrasting characteristics. The goal with contrast is to produce a unique communication that couldn't exist without the contrast. What kind of form will it be? The logo has to be a unit, a standalone unit. Is it a locked unit? Is the locked unit a basic shape, a circle, a square, an oval, triangle, trapezoid, and so on? Is the locked unit shape organic, rectilinear, curvilinear, irregular, an accidental shape, for example, a spill? Is it a recognizable closed shape? such as a flower, human form, star, tree, animal? Is it an unlocked unit, meaning that part of the type or image breaks through the basic unit, extending into very nearby surrounding graphic space? Is it freeform, not contained or locked by a geometric or other rigid shape acting as the boundary, but it's still an independent unit? and it still holds together. That's key. It must be unified. How will you visualize the logo? Will you use line, tone? Will it be organic, geometric, open, closed, flat, volumetric? Will it have texture or pattern? And here are some examples. Color. Color is not universal. That's something that you must keep in mind. It must be appropriate for your brand, for your personal brand, and appropriate for your audience as well. For example, if you're trying to attract clients who are mostly male, certain colors probably are better than others. Color symbolism is not universal. It's culture specific. And you can look that up in terms of what color means in different cultures. Color is perceived in relation to the hues, values, and neutrals that surround it. Color can be used to create a focal point. Color can differentiate a graphic element from others in a composition. 
Color establishes connections among graphic elements, and it, it establishes them very quickly and very easily. Color can be thematic. It can define a section of a website or a resume. And of course, you have to have a color palette that you use across your identity. Typeface is crucial. Your typography is absolutely crucial to everything in your identity. Uh, and type can actually be a point of departure. Uh, designer Dan Mall suggests starting with a typeface's characteristics as a point of departure. Consider how the typeface's visual voice works for your brand, personality, and visual style. What do the typeface's characteristics communicate on a secondary level? Again, there's always connotation. Are you going to use serif or sans serif? If you're using serif, what's the shape of the serif? Are you using bracketed serifs or serifs without brackets? What are the proportions and aesthetics of the letter forms you're using? The orientation, the lean. What's the overall shape of the letter forms? For example, is the O round or oval? And how does that coordinate to other elements in your identity? What are the shape of other elements of the typeface? Counters, bowls, apex. If you're using contrast, is there thick and thin? How extreme is it? Is it an even weight line? Is there variation in the line, line width? Select weight based on design concept, content, context, and aesthetics. Think about all the details, the serif, the serif shapes, the single story or two story construction of lowercase letters, bowls, ligatures, finishes. Context is absolutely crucial. Will the typeface be seen in print or on screen? Will it be seen close up or far away? Think about all the sizes of your visual identity, from a very small business card in mobile to resume to desktop, or maybe there's something you have that's on a digital wall or a huge public screen. What's the function? How is it display or text? How extensive is the font family that you're using? An extensive font family can really give you a lot of flexibility. Do you have upper and lower case? What's included in the font that you're buying? Is it available for screen from a trusted web foundry, and will they include a print font with it for the same price? Does the web foundry allow you to test the font on the screen before you buy it? Pairing typefaces is always an issue for a lot of people. You want to select for contrast, yet similar proportions. That's one way to do it. There are a lot of ways to do it. You can mix structural classifications, a sans serif with a slab serif. Pair complementary faces, for example, select for contrast but similar X heights. Again, time, type, sense, and sensibility. You have the skill set that you went to school and learned, but your, your design sensibility comes out in typography truly and uniquely. Your resume. Resume is an interesting design problem. It informs. The reader is able to glean information easily. It identifies. The reader recognizes the design as distinct and memorable. It promotes. It fosters the reader's interest in you. Now, there are two basic approaches to the resume. The inventive resume, it can be visually inventive, verbally inventive, perhaps both if you can manage it but it has to have impeccable typography. The straight up and functional resume, no whim, no whimsy, no wackiness, impeccable typography. There's a really good article available online called Will a Graphic Resume Get You the Job? If you search the title, uh, I'm, I'm providing the URL, but if you search it, you'll find it. And it, it Experts weigh in on whether you should have an inventive resume or a straight-up resume. That's a real argument in the design community. In that article, Rob Wallace suggests, don't let design disrupt communication. Don't let the design interfere with the fact that it is an information problem as well as an identity and promotional problem.
design problem. And finally, your visual identity, your website. Today, your website may be the most critical channel for your personal brand. You want to make sure the content is clear. Your writing must be clear. Short sentences, clarity, the visual layout must be streamlined. The visual design is consistent with your visual identity and other channels. The overall brand experience is positive, and it has to function. How well does it function? How long do I have to sit and wait for things to load? Can I find things easily? The best way to think about a personal brand website is to think of it as a museum. It showcases your work and capabilities. It is a showcase. What a portfolio used to be, a hard portfolio case used to be, is a website today. Present content in chunks. People don't like to read too much at once on a website. The chunks, however, must be unified by an underlying structure. I recommend thinking about using a modular grid. It, it, you can do chunking on a modular grid very well. And make it easy to see your work and find your work. If I have to hunt around, I'm not going to be happy. Here are some examples of people whose visual identity, brand, personal brand identity, I think, are, are very well done. Most of these people are in my book. Uh, the, the penultimate and last entry, uh, Duvik, is Roberto Duvik. I think that's a really interesting one for somebody who does many different things. So is Debbie Millman's. Actually, almost everybody there does several different things, and you can see how they compartmentalize their brand. And the last one is Denise Mitterhofer, a student of mine who just graduated, who has a wonderful personal project on her home page and then has all her other work available. By the way, personal projects, if you are interested in them, um, can really help distinguish you. In my book, I offer a BYOB checklist. Now, if you want to know if your brand is working, you must critique it. And I think this checklist can really help you go back and say, what is my brand personality? This is strategic because my communication goals are all these, are these all the things I want people to think about me, and so on. So the checklist is in the book, and it's also here in the webinar for your use. It's very important to self-critique and self-evaluate to see if it's working. So just to recap a little bit, your identity is an example of interesting form. In other words, it's a design that you've created. It should be compelling and interesting and have very engaging form. You want to induce a positive emotion, not a negative emotion. You want to create, induce a positive emotion in your audience. Your identity is a demonstration of what you can do of your personal best. You need to differentiate yourself. It must be you. It must be authentic. It's not John. It's not Maria. It's you. What can you do? What are your capabilities? Find a unique selling proposition. What's your story? Codify it. Find the essence of your story. Create unique form. And remember that the form follows the story. So this 10-step guide is codify your vision, determine the value you promise to deliver, tell pieces of your story across multiple channels, determine your core message, your verbal identity, write a pithy elevator speech, underlining pithy, write a succinct Twitter bio, design a visual identity to best represent and differentiate you, Choose type for clarity, distinction, and communication. Treat your resume as an information, identity, and promotional design problem. And offer a streamlined website experience that showcases your work. Thank you.
if you want to reach me, ask any questions, the best place to get me, I really prefer the old school of email, rlanda at cane.edu, but you can also find me on Twitter and my own website, and on Facebook I have a page for my book, Build Your Own Brand, and for those of you who are, are wondering whether you should have one or two websites, I'm actually considering Robin Landa University, which why I'm considering it and as an experiment to see whether we should have one or two websites. So I will entertain questions. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much, uh, Robin. That was fantastic. And we've been tweeting back and forth. Um, so I do have some questions. Um, my first one was came in uh, prior to the, to the uh, program. Uh, and this uh, attendee writes, I'm an editorial designer primarily. How should I position myself for this kind of work I already have one major client, which is an association that still publishes a print magazine. So editorial designer, um, that sounds like graphic design and, and writing. Uh, well, I think it's, it's if you're an editorial designer or a promotional designer, identity designer, I think the rules are pretty much the same. You still need to have a unified brand presence. The website can specifically discuss editorial design, your point of view on it, and if that's what you want to keep doing and those are the kind of clients you want, then you can gear it that way. However, I think you still have to go through this process of codifying your brand essence and what makes you unique as an editorial designer. What is it that you can, add, how, can how do you add value to somebody's editorial project? I think it's, it's a similar process. Right. Um, in all your teaching experience, especially in teaching, what have you seen as the main mistakes that young designers make with their own branding? That's a good question. They make a lot of mistakes, and that's actually why I wrote this book, to help them. The, I would say the two biggest mistakes. One is they think of themselves as a corporation. They create a corporate identity. And they're not a corporation, and they're not a brand studio yet. They're, my students are each individuals. And I think thinking of yourself as corporate is the wrong direction. Secondly, they give too much backstory. There's too much information on the website. They write too much. Their bio's too long, or it's too generic. So editing is a really important factor. Again, what you omit is as important as what you leave in. Right. Um. Oh, and then I'll, I'll add one more thing. Yeah. Typography must be impeccable. Uh, often the resume has less than impeccable typography, even though they've been, that's, we hope it's been hammered into their heads. So again, impeccable typography across the brand. Um, do you see any pros slash cons, and I think you've already talked about this, but in a design branding themselves based on their own name versus under a business name of sorts. So uh, although, let's see, Jane Eyre Design versus Sunshine Design. That those, Jane Eyre Design is kind of not really the best example because that's not what her name is, but I think what she's suggesting is Robin Landa Design, or, or is it better to say Sunshine Design? I think it depends, again, on the, your overall sense of who you are and what you want and how you want to be perceived. So, for example, when Sagmeister started out, it was Sagmeister. Modern Dog Design does not name the two partners in the design firm, and they're hugely successful, and Modern Dog is memorable. So you really have to think about what works best for you, what's your brand personality, who your audience is, is your name memorable? If it's not memorable, perhaps a symb symbolic name. Again, I think it's part of the investigation. And it, it's, you could have two considerations and explore them equally and see what works best for you. So this is an interesting one. So what if you have skills you want to promote in two different markets, like book design and then maybe textile design? Could uh, one web website develop, uh, deliver your brand for both, or is that, a, is that a good idea? And then going back to um, maybe some of the URLs, that's kind of the part of the brand, too. 
right. This is this is the big question, and I anticipated that question, so I have something ready. It's really we're talking about creating a logical system for your brand architecture. So if you're addressing different markets or you having different different capabilities, the old school way of discussing this was it was a house of brands versus a branded house. And the new school way of talking about it breaks it down a little further. But basically, go back to the old school, in a house of brands, every capability that you have is individually branded. In the branded house, each capability leverages the equity of the parent name or the parent brand. What I have found for individuals, even people like um, top people in their industry like Roberto DeVeek or Debbie Millman, they have one website and things are sub-branded in on the one website. What you have to think about is how hard is it going to be for you to take care of two websites, design two websites, promote two websites where people find you. I, I think the best route probably is a branded house. Now, if you have a specific function that you need, for example, I may be thinking about uh, teaching from Robin Landa University, then that's a very different kind of functioning website. So if there is something that you need to have a capability for or a system for, for a strategic purpose, then we talk about that as a hybrid brand. But again, you have to monitor all of that. So the easiest route is to have a branded house with different tabs on your website, different categories, in my opinion, at this point. Um, how about combining fine art and graphic design in, into an identity? So someone might be more of a pop graphic designer, but then they also create fine art that they sell? I think people do that as yeah. well. I, yeah, I've seen that happen. Uh, I, I can't recall his name. I was looking at somebody's website today. Greg Lachey, who is, uh, can, calls himself an interdisciplinary artist, he's a commercial photographer, has everything on his one website. Again, it's sort of uh, tabbing it and, and sub-branding it. I don't think I'd mix them on the same pages or the same scroll, but I think you can have uh, two, many capabilities under the one name. Uh, the, the caution is to make it very clear that they, they are distinct. Right. Um, is it okay to build a brand around one's personality? like fun-loving and humorous rather than one's work. I guess that's a little touchy because when you brand something, your goal is to get work, I suppose. Right. And I think you can do that. I mean, okay. um, there are agencies, uh, the old agency Cliff Freeman, for example, branded themselves on being funny. Almost all the work that they did was funny. Now, the work reflected the brand personality. But I think it's certainly a way to distinguish yourself. Um, the fellow that I was referencing earlier, James Foster, who has Jimmy the Kid, his whole website is a parody, and it's very funny and entertaining. And not all the work is funny, but it, it's about him. And I think, that, I think that's fine if it resonates with the audience. And of course, you have to analyze it and critique it. You know, I'd have to say one of the biggest challenges, and I'm going to throw this out, most people on this phone probably have seen what Sagmeister did to introduce himself years ago, and then again introduce his partner. How did that hurt or help his brand? And just for people who know, they posed naked on, um, on uh, cards and sent them to clients. Uh, it, very interesting. He wasn't the first person to do that. There was an artist, I think in the 70s, named Linda Bangless, who, who the invitation to her show was herself nude, and it caused a big uproar in the fine art community. So he follows in good footsteps. I think he got, I think he got all the publicity he needed. I think it's on target with him as an individual. He's uh, 
wonderful, he's a terrific guy, by the way, and he's, uh, he's, he's strong, he's powerful. I, I really think it fit the brand, and I think people don't expect anything less from him. Um, what's your opinion of portfolio sites, such as Behance? I think they're fine. I think that you can mount your portfolio on a, in a variety of places. If you don't want to create your own website, uh, you can join professional organizations like the AIGA, the One Club, uh, and they, you can put your portfolio up there. There's Creative Hot List. Um, there are different ways to do it, but of course if you do that, you're immediately saying that you don't design websites. So if that's not a worry for you and that's not a capability, that's fine. As long as somebody, a potential employer, can find you. What about, um, uh, this goes back to some of the questions that came out up before as well. How do you know, and I think you talked about this, how do you know you've developed a strong brand and how do you get feedback? One of the challenges I think sometimes is knowing who to ask for feedback. I know that we, the um, how actually offers critiques um, for portfolios, I think it's like $59, um, which would obviously be, be very objective because they don't know who the person is. But again, it's also subjective depending on who's doing it. So I guess my question is from this person, where do you solicit the feedback? Right. You can solicit it in a variety of ways. I think that it's good to crowdsource a little in social media. I think it's if you went to a design program, you can always ask professors, you can ask a potential employer. I think people hesitate to ask, but people are usually very generous. I, I think I almost always answer anybody's request unless I missed it for some reason and I'm overwhelmed, but I, I, I usually answer. I think uh, it's good to get different opinions and ask people to consider sharing it, ask for feedback, but again, here's the caveat. If you change it based on what everyone says, you're going to end up by just carving it up. So you have to trust uh, a reliable source most uh, for the most input and criticism. I've gotten people on LinkedIn in some of the groups. I've seen them post things like, can you tell me what you think about this? So maybe that's another good um, way to do it. I think LinkedIn probably is a good uh, source. I think it's it's better if you have some experience as a pro because you can filter out. I've had students put projects up online in, in chat rooms and forums and then they get the most awful advice. So you have to be really careful about who's giving the advice. Right. And, and I think sometimes also realize that a person's, uh, their suggestion isn't a direct reflection on the artist or the or right. Per, yeah. Um, okay, this is an interesting question. Should an agency of two people present themselves as larger than they are? No. Or, or, <laughs> or embrace its smallness? I guess the question is, does small equal amateur? No. Uh, Modern Dog has two primary designers. Uh, small is a boutique, and small means you get a lot of attention from the principals. People aren't going to come to you uh, for multiple capabilities, so they're not going to expect you to do PR for them as well, or, or maybe write copy, maybe you do. They'll come to you for the attention, for the, the boutique creativity. Sometimes large agencies aren't as creative as small ones. I'd say be authentic, be who you are, use that to your advantage. Sagmeister started off very small. Right, and maybe show the work that you do so they, people can see it's a little bit more innovative or, right. or not. Um, what about brand champion programs? Any advice on where to start on how to develop an internal program uh, with incentives? Well, that's more of a corporate question. That's a really yeah. good question. Uh, it's less about personal branding and more about... That's true. Uh, I'm sorry? No, I was just saying that's true. I wonder if you could make it more of a brand champion for yourself. Would that be, I guess the question then becomes, and I've heard some of the questions here, should an agency, so that's not personal branding either, but in a way sometimes it is. I guess that's kind of where it's kind of a, hard to really wrap your head around personal branding and corporate branding if it's your own business. Right. I mean, corporate branding is um, a bigger 
problem personal is, is you're a small studio or, uh, or it's an individual. Uh, corporate is different and within the corporations they have brand champion programs and that's a, that's a whole other topic. But mm -hmm. you can be your own brand champion which means that you have to promote your, your qualities relentlessly and you, you can get somebody else to champion you. Again, word of mouth is still the most precious promotion you can get. Uh, a client can be a, be a brand champion for you. Uh, you can ask. You can always ask. You can uh, ask politely and ask people to consider sharing your website, sharing your, your, all the things that you do. So there are different ways to find brand sirens, brand champions for you. Do you think that's a good idea to ask people for quotes for your website and your collateral material? I think it depends. You have to really know if it's going to annoy someone or alienate someone. Uh, some people do that. Endorsements are, are good. Testimonials are good. I think people believe testimonials and endorsements. I think you have to be really careful about whether they add value or not and who's saying them. Right. And you don't want to alienate any clients by asking. Sure. Well, we are a little over, so I want to uh, give it back to you, Robin. Um, wanted to just re before I do, I wanted to remind everybody that you, if you did order the combo and you are getting a book, um, you will get that in the mail. If you did not order her book, you can still do that at mydesignshop.com. Uh, and um, we look forward to having you at some of our future programs. Um, and I think that's all I have. I'm going to hand it back to you, uh, Robin. And thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. Great. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your spending the time with me. The best of good luck. Here's to your personal brand. <laughs>